we need to accept everybody in their weirdness and yeah. just celebrate all the weirdness of diversity because we're weirdos, you're, we're all weirdos. In these high trust organizations, employees not only enjoy their jobs more, they're more productive, they're more innovative, they take fewer sick days, mm. um, and they are better citizens. Not that I want you to be happy at work. I don't. Happiness is this acute state like, oh, I got a free taco or whatever. I could care less. What I want you to do is at the end of the day, be tired and go, holy crap, we did something important today. Welcome back to Future Work, the podcast about a happier future of work and the role of technology and humans within that. Today, I'm speaking with Paul J. Zak, a neuroscientist and economics professor whose work focuses on human connection, human happiness, and effective teamwork. Paul is a five-time TED speaker, is in the top 0.3% of the most cited scientists, has given talks in 30 countries, and wrote the 2017 HBR classic, The Neuroscience of Trust. Today, Paul shares insights from his extensive research on how trust influences productivity, innovation, and well-being in the workplace, providing a roadmap to foster a culture of trust and empowerment. All that and the importance of embracing our weirdness. So let's dive in. Hey Paul, thanks so much for being here today. So people just have heard in the intro your very impressive resume, but what's something that you want people to remember you for at the end of this interview? Um, really understanding that humans are weirdos. You and <laughs> we all are. And that's because our brain is doing all this work unconsciously that we're not aware of. So we're varying in our behavior that we're not mm. aware of, but other people are. So that means that we need to accept everybody in their weirdness and yeah. just celebrate all the weirdness of diversity because we're weirdos, you're, we're all weirdos. And so it's just not that big of a deal. We'll have good days and bad days. So yeah, accept everybody the way they are. I love it. Then let's switch from weirdos to one of your big topics, which is uh, trust, trust and neuroscience. You've written and spoken a lot about trust in the workplace. And it's a big topic for a lot of people who are currently leading teams, especially hybrid teams and remote teams where you don't really see your team members all that often. What's trust in today's workplace and how can people build it and maintain it? Right. So let's do the opposite question. What happens if we're in a zero trust workplace? Mm. Then I have to micromanage everybody in my you know, direct reports, which means I can't do my job because I'm managing everyone else's life. And if you're an employee whose boss is managing them, you know, nth degree, it's not fun for you because you're there because you have some skills and you wanted to express those skills and do a good job and feel like you have control over your life. So the micromanaging is a zero trust world. So now let's flip it. In the high trust world, and this is not trust without some verification. It's always trust and verify, right? You have this much smoother process, right? So in the micromanaging world, you have a lot of friction. You're constantly looking over my shoulder, doing all kinds of things. But in the high trust world, I'm giving you the freedom to do your job. Presumably you're trained well that you've been trained to do, that you get satisfaction from doing. That mm. means that the supervisor can do his or her job, can focus on strategy, can focus on bigger picture ideas and not you know, being on the front line all the time. And so what we find is that in these high trust organizations, employees not only enjoy their jobs more, they're more productive, they're more innovative, they take fewer sick days, mm. um, and they are better citizens, better family members, better partners, outside of work because they're not getting beat up and being treated like children at work. So again, trust and verify. I want to give people some freedom to do what they've been trained to do and and make sure they have sufficient training to do that. But I also want to do lots of check-ins, right? So mm -hmm. I'm a believer in the daily huddle. I don't know about you, but I love that daily huddle. Real quick, you know, three questions. What did you do yesterday? What's your plan today? What do you need help with? Like that's all yeah. I really need to know. And then, you know, every week, a little deeper check-in on a one-on-one, -on -one, right? The daily huddles everybody. Then on one-on-one, -on -one, hey, what's going on? Oh, you're behind schedule on this? Make sure, how do I help you meet that milestone, right? So the kind of coaching approach, I think, is the high trust approach. But again, I'm not micromanaging you. I make sure that I am the problem solver. I'm the person who can help you be mm. successful. I love that idea of almost two opposite sides of the spectrum. One is being trust and one is being micromanagement. I feel like a lot of us have experienced that. And then do you think that, is it hard for people to trust other people? I mean, it sounds like a very obvious question, but it is one of these themes that comes up a lot. 
Can I really trust people, especially when I don't see them? Can I trust them to be doing the work to be productive? Is it hard for people to be trusting? That's the most profound and fundamental question. Yeah. Why do we ever trust strangers? And so by identifying the brain signals that tell us that someone around us, a stranger in particular, is trustworthy, then we can identify what promotes or inhibits that response. So a couple mm. examples. You were on an airplane last week. Did you check with a pilot? Do you, I mean, really? This is your Definitely. life. So, I opened the plane door. I went straight to the cockpit. I said, <laughs> right. okay, let me show you. were arrested. <laughs> right. Credentials, please. Yeah. Right. So again, we have institutions, right? So uh, whatever airline you were flying on, we have institutions. We have a bunch of systems that help us gain trust in other people, mm. even though we don't know them. But at the same time, what we've shown neurologically is that as social creatures, because we are so deeply attuned to very subtle social signals that our default is to trust people, right? And mm. we can be taken advantage of by con men, for example, who play on that. But generally, there's such a big benefit of trusting others, right? We can be friends, we can work together, right? I don't need to put a cop in every corner if people are trustworthy. And if we think about your home country, the Netherlands, one of the great trading nations for going on a thousand years. Why? Very high levels of trust, right? They mm. built the Hanseatic League, particularly to have a guarantee that when you trade with us, it's yeah. all going to work out. And if, if things go south, we have some insurance in place and we're going to make sure that we make you whole because we want to have that repeat business. So to me, trust today's world, trust is driving up employee experience. So when I have control of my mm. life, called control that I feel better about my job. I'm not being micromanaged. I feel like I can grow as a professional and as a person mm. um, in time. I'm reducing those frictions. I'm more productive and I provide better customer service. So now I'm raising customer lifetime value because mm. the experience the customer has by an employee who's excited about being here as opposed yeah. to maybe you haven't had this experience, Don, but I've worked in places where I had that micromanaging boss. He often yells. I don't like yelling. I'm a grinder. Like I would work 15 hours a day. Don't yell at me because you're upset about something I had nothing to do with. Yeah. And I would just look at the clock, you know, be like, All right. dude, 505, I am going home. Like yeah. I got to get myself another job. Right. So I think there's so many benefits of having a mm. high organization and we should lean into them. And these are not soft skills. These are the hard skills, right? People it's hard, we yeah. Establish. People's are weirdo, are weirdos, yeah. right? So yeah. Managing humans means accepting that you're going to have good and bad days, but also being that coach, being that cheerleader, giving you a mm. chance to really grow into this new situation. Amazing. And then you also mentioned this idea of neuroscience, right? So you wrote this very famous now, I think 2017, very famous HBR article, Neuroscience and Trust, right? What is it that people should know about neuroscience? So what are our brains telling us about how we should lead and how we should work? Right. So the signals that tell us whether we should trust another person are almost completely out of our conscious awareness. Mm. And so what that means is that we've got to have either a measurement technology to, to mm. measure that or think about the ways we can organize the humans at work so that we facilitate, again, trust, but verification. So mm. things like many people autonomy, we talked about hybrid work. So for hybrid work, I want to do check-ins and probably more than once a day, but not every hour, right? So if you're doing fine, hey, it's three o'clock, Don, just checking in, everything yeah. going good? Yep, good to go, right? That's all I need to know, right? Mm. Uh, otherwise, or, hey, you know what? I got a big problem when the server went down. Hey, I need your help right now. Like I need yeah. you to be able to be reliable to go, okay, everything I'm doing else, that, that can wait. But if our customers can't use our software, we're yeah. kind of screwed. So we get it, right. That's that's another trustworthy level. That if I need mm. you there, if I say I need you now, I need you now. Like, yeah. Don't say, well, you know, it's it's uh, I don't know, it's quarter to five, and you know, my day's over at five. No, your day's not over for having a crisis. It's all hands on deck. So you need those kind of people. But it ultimately comes down to really giving people the opportunity to have the satisfaction of having challenges to grow, to be coached into having an amazing experience at work. Mm. And that's a weird statement, right? Amazing experience. First of all, this is work. This is labor. Is it yes. supposed to be fun? No, it's not supposed to be fun. I want you on. I'm talking to you. I'm putting energy in. So I call this state immersion, right? I am focused mm. on this. I'm putting a lot of energy into this conversation with you. Mm. But when I'm done, I'll have the satisfaction like, 
that was a pretty good interview, I think, you know, right. like, so I want that at work. I want you to be on. I want you burning energy. I don't want you flipping around on your phone, looking at whatever. I yeah. want you, hey, we got stuff to do. We got milestones. That's a that's a leadership perspective. Mm. On the other hand, if I've trained you and you know your goals and you're part of a team that depends on mm. you, most people will then perform quite well, actually, if you give them that kind of trust. And is that where where neuroscience come in? Like, what can what can we learn from that when we think about building that trust and and also that that theme of immersion? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's so many parts to that. Let me try to summarize and be useful. The first is that it is not unnatural for mm. humans or strangers or ungenetically related to be working together. We have these social brains. We like to be together. To do that properly, I need to depend on my team, trust, and to mm. know where I'm going. So from a leadership perspective, yes, I want to have trust, but also want to be clear on the why. Why do mm. we exist as an organization? Why are we doing this thing? It's not just the what. The what's obvious, right? Hey, we got a, we got a project. We got to finish for this client next Friday. Okay, great. Why? This is an important client. We're going to develop a stronger relationship with this client. Um, this is a very interesting project that helps us learn a lot of things we can use with other clients, right? So that why is really important to establishing trust. If it's just what, I'm back in the micromanaging kind of world. Hmm. And then next, I can do a lot of things that promote or inhibit trust from a neurologic perspective. For example, um, one of the factors that radically inhibits the neurochemical that signals that someone is trustworthy is testosterone. So mm. what does that mean? If I create a very conflictual, internally competitive environment, like the old Jack Welsh rank and yank, that means I have in-group conflict. And all yeah. that does is say, screw you. I'm going to keep this job and you're not and make sure you get fired. Okay, that's really bad. Now that mm. out-group competition, competition with my competitors, means we come together as a team. We're going to fight to keep our jobs, to grow, to get those bonuses. Mm. Right, that's all good, but mm. I don't want to have in-group competition. Nor do I want to signal that there's a strong hierarchy. So we see that high trust mm. organizations tend to have flat management structures. So if I walk in to my new business or whatever, and I'm wearing yeah. a five thousand dollar suit, and everybody else has a t-shirt and jeans, that's a kind of a fu kind of approach, right? Which is like I'm the goddamn boss, do what I say, as opposed to. Yeah. If we're all, I don't do a software development, wear a hoodie and jeans. I don't care. Right? Yeah. It's just, it's, you know, yeah. if everyone's pulling together, mm. it's really, so here, here's a, I think I'm still at 30,000 feet. Here's a super useful trip. Tr sorry, trick for leaders. Show vulnerability. So it turns out mm. that people like you, Don, who are too beautiful, too perfect, too smart, we kind of hate those people a little bit. Right. So there's really strong findings in psychology yeah. If you show vulnerability, if you're competent, but you show vulnerability, yeah. people want to work harder for you, right? So I say, hey, Don, you know, we got this new project on machine learning. I understand a little bit, but that's really your mm. gig. So I'd love to have you take charge of this project. And then please tell me what you're doing so I can learn more. Mm. Now, I can say that in a team meeting, even if I'm your boss. First of all, if I'm your boss, you know I'm not a machine learning expert, if you are, right? Because you're an expert. Yeah. So I'm endowing you with that trust, with that ability, that respect even, to do your thing, but then mm. be part of the team. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure the client knows that we're developing this new software, blah, blah, blah. So again, I'm I'm just making all this up now. But yeah. you know, that's a sense in which I want to empower individuals to be mm. valuable as opposed to, you must do this thing. Yeah. And here's my, my plea forever. Sorry, you opened a really big door and I'm taking the whole space. There's no more babies, right? right. Have you realized the whole world is aging except for Africa and they'll start aging in the next 10 or 12 years. So... For Europe, for the U.S., uh, much of Asia, uh, the population is getting older, which means the mm -hmm. number of people working is yeah. getting smaller. So the people yeah. are working. We've got to keep them engaged, excited, physically healthy, and emotionally fit. And so we can lead in and talk about emotional fitness later. But again, if I'm beating you up at work and you're like, screw this, I am done, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm going to go on vacation or I'm going to take some other low stress job. So I, I work at sort of, I'm medicine adjacent. I, I work uh, a lot in psychiatry research. And I know on two hands, doctors that went through the COVID thing that are anesthesiologists or nephrologists or whatever. Mm. And then when I see you care, this, that's not their specialty. They were, you know, all hands on deck for all the COVID stuff. And guys who were 52, 53, 54, they're like, you know what? I got 25 years of medicine. I got money in the bank. I'm done. 
I'm retiring. Yeah. I'm going to go play yeah. golf. Yeah. Like, okay, so that's the typical employee you have to worry about, right? Which is yeah. a person who's in industry, they're in the early 50s, are like, I'm good. I'm going to walk yeah. away. You have no more employees. Yeah, right. That's, that seems to be one of the big shifting themes of like, okay, now we actually have to try and create a great experience for those employees because we not only want to attract the best people, hopefully trustworthy people, but we also want to get the best out of them and we want to keep them because the moment that you lose good people, I just recorded with uh, Debbie Lovick from the Boston Consulting Group. You know, she called it like, you know, when you lose a 20 year bottle of scotch, you know, you cannot just quickly recreate that, right? Like when you lose those really great people that understand your company, that understand your customers, how to create a good product, you lose a lot more than just one person, right? You use all that knowledge. And so therefore, does trust become even more important because trust also builds over time? It does build over time, right? It's e easily broken, but again, we default to it. Mm. I think from a leadership perspective, you really need to be on the front lines at least once a month. Mm. So I think of Jim Senegal who started Costco, right? A big warehouse store. You know, he would, he just retired, but he would go to work every day. He'd go in the stores, wear that short sleeve white shirt with a you know name tag that said Jim on it. And he'd be out there, you know, moving boxes, talking to customers. He knew his business and he yeah. became a billionaire and yeah. he never took more than a hundred thousand dollars in salary. He's mm. like, man, equity, like I, you know, I let's let's put that money back into the business. Let's pay the employees well, which they do. So mm. if you look at the turnover at Costco versus their closest competitor, which is the Walmart store, warehouse store, Sam's Club, mm -hmm. Costco pays about a 40% premium. Employee turnover is much lower. Prices mm. are a little bit higher than Sam's Club, but not a lot. But they're getting all this benefit of creating a great workplace. Yep. And, you know, I, I haven't seen the breakdown by profit margins, but I'm I'm just guessing margins are higher at Costco than Sam's Club. They do well, yeah. And, and of course, the customer also feels that, right? Because if you go to your favorite store and you're greeted by people who are happy to be there and who know you because you've been shopping there for a few years and they have been there for a few years, that's a very different experience. And that's where you see that link between the CX and the EX, right? The customer experience and the and the employee right. experience, right? And that's probably why that's why that's so important. And also use technology. I mean, in my mm. uh, immersion, you know, I talk about going to the Four Seasons at Sydney and going there twice mm. in the course of a week and going a couple of days, going somewhere else, coming back. And when I came back, the the doorman, as I got the taxi, greeted me. Oh, hello, Dr. Zach. Welcome back. Your room is ready. Here's the key. Oh, my God. Like, I've been traveling yeah. all day. I'm tired. I'm feeling the love from the Four Seasons. So now, mm. you know, I have so where to stay, the Marriott or the Four Seasons, put me in the Four Seasons because it's going to yeah. be great. Now, that's yeah. a technology issue. Now, it's also training, but there's a technology. They know who's coming in. They know what they're looking for. They look at the tag on my luggage. So the whole system there. So in terms of customization at scale, technology can help us do that. A really good mm -hmm. CR piece of software should remind you all the time what you're doing, how to make that experience great for the customer. Even if you didn't see personally the customer before, mm -hmm. if they're a regular customer, they should know you. Absolutely. And it's the same for employees, right? Like what is more, you know, what is better than getting recognized by, for example, your boss remembering that it's a certain milestone, like a certain amount of years that you've been working there, or it's your birthday, or maybe even your kids' birthdays, right? Like all of those things, it's easier than ever for us to track that and to use then that data to really get that sort of like trust relationship with the employee, but we often don't do it. You just mentioned the word love, and I remember that actually you've also been talking a lot about oxytocin recently. Can you maybe share a little bit about oxytocin in the role and the role that that plays in, in the workplace? Sure. So oxytocin is a neurochemical, one of the roughly 200 that are active in the brain. That seems to be this core signal that tells mm. us that someone around us is safe or trustworthy, and it motivates mm. us to interact with them. We have shown that there's an interplay, we and others, between oxytocin and another neurochemical dopamine, dopamine is associated with goal direction. I want to get something, I want to do this something, kind of motivation. Mm -hmm. This feedback uh, between these two creates the way that the brain values social or emotional experiences. So everything from watching a movie to at work, mm -hmm. the more immersive it is, the more valuable it is to the brain. So once we have this measure of immersion, which we can get by applying algorithms, think like smartwatches, then we mm. can actually ask objectively and passively, hey, how is the employee experience? Or how is the customer experience? Or mm. why does this ad 
produce sales and some other doesn't by tapping into these old unconscious evolutionarily old parts of the brain mm -hmm. uh, so that we can improve experiences at all those different levels we just talked about. And so again, this is 20 years of my academic life, identifying how the brain values these social emotional experiences. But yeah. You no, know, if I going back to love, if I love in the filia sense, if I love my employees, if I care about the people I work with, I'm going to put more goddamn effort in. Let's be honest about yeah, that, right? For so sure. Yeah. If I'm in, like we're all doing this thing, I'm working hard. We're all in this together. Again, this kind of moderate level of stress. We have milestones to hit. We're kind of working together. That's exciting. So yeah. again, the the relationship between oxytocin and immersion, more broadly, this valuation mm. mechanism of the brain tells us that when I have deeply immersive experiences, they are deeply satisfying. So mm. it's not that I want you to be happy at work. I don't. Happiness is this acute state like, oh, I got a free taco or whatever. I could care less. What I want you to do is at the end of the day, be tired and go, holy crap, we did something important today. Me yeah. and the other people I work with, like we had this hard project. We kicked butt today. Yeah. I feel good about that. Highly immersive, right? Mm. Happiness is a cute spike that, you know, goes away very quickly. Fine. I mean, that's, yeah. it's makes me happy, but having that long-term kind of thriving or flourishing, that's what immersion yeah. captures. And that's driven by the oxytocin and dopamine release that says, this is important to you. And I think most people probably only know oxytocin from like a mom's hug or something like that, right? How do we replicate that in the workplace? And especially as you and I right now, sitting in different parts of the world talking online is that something that can can actually happen even when we're connecting and and, and maybe the role of, of immersion within that yes right so we found that immersion online is between mm. 50 percent of the immersion you have in person right so mm. in person i have as you said we have touch i have smell i have a better eye contact and so all that is expressing emotion that says mm. hey you're important you're valuable you talked about recognition earlier it's so easy to recognize someone. Now, the neuroscience says that impact on the behavior will be more if the recognition is for, hey, Don, that project you did last week kicked butt. Our client was thrilled. You got it in on mm. time. This is amazing, right? So that the kind of thing is really important. If I do that publicly, now yeah. I set aspirations for the whole team. Oh, yeah, mm. Don's kicking butt, right? That's yeah. amazing. And everyone else says well i like to be recognized it's, we all want to be recognized right so again the, the neuroscience build mm. in, in these expectations on how to build these teams that want to continue to perform at their highest level so recognition is important having that chit chat time is nice what we miss on this because yeah. we scheduled it although we chit chatted before we started recording is the random collision where you know yeah. we talk about movies or girls or boys or whatever people talk about and then when Oh yeah, you're working on that big. Pro What's that project you're working on? You do yeah. the project. You want yeah. so right. So we, you know, it it's not work life balance. It's really integration. We're integrating all this. So if you love mm. what you do, you talk about it all the time. Look, it's it's late night for me, or moderately late night for me. Why am I talking to you? I love what I do, man. It's right. so awesome that you're excited yeah. about what I'm excited about. Yeah. That's really thrilling for me. How nice yeah. is that? So, do I have to stop talking about work because it's after five p.m. Hell no, not the way I work, not the way you Definitely work. Definitely not in this case. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And then like, what are some some things that people can do practically? And again, I love that word immersion because I think, you know, especially when you're working online, it's just so difficult to really get that energy going, right? And to make people feel like they're immersed in your, your world as a manager, as a leader of kind of your excitement about the work, right? What are some things that people can do to, to immerse people more? I think that's really the, the question. Right. So again, just for listeners, I am using immersion in a technical sense. This is a mm -hmm. neurologic data stream that we can capture using big machines, using smartwatches, right? It, so I have a very precise way to capture second by second how valuable or how, how much immersion the experience creates. So that means I can tune my behavior, perhaps as a leader, to be better at that. So number one, build in time, even if you have remote teams, to physically see them. Again, I would say at once a month if possible, right? Mm. Excuse me. That could be the leader going to different sites, or it could be we bring everyone together for a one or two day, you know, in, in mass. It's really important to build that social relationship. The second is do the thing that we naturally do, which is share your personal life. So even if you can't have 
in-person happy hour, you could have once a month Zoom happy hour, right? And just mm. talk about, again, whatever you're talking about. Because as we build that connection, that friendship, that attachment to each other, well, now I trust you more. I know more about your life. I know you're not a serial killer, probably. But, you know, right, I, I get more of a sense of who you are. And so lastly, from a leadership perspective, don't avoid the emotional information that people are giving out for your direct reports. Mm. Mm. If you see someone who is happy, sad, you can open up that doorway without being bothersome mm. and say, hey, Don, gosh, you, you look tired today. Are you all right? And maybe yeah. you say, oh, you know what? My kid has the flu. I've been up all night. And if I were a smart leader, I would say, because there's no more babies, there's no more you, I would say, hey, do you need to be here? Can you just check in with your team and go home, get some rest? I'd much rather have you. So or I'd rather have you go home and rest and come back on target tomorrow than yeah. have presentism. So to me, that's smart mm. management. Mm. Concrete example. I have a woman who's worked with me for 15 years, same Beth. She was my PhD student. Now she works in my company. One day she walked to my lab in the morning and she was like walking on air. And I said, what happened with you? Like, I always want my graduate students to fall in love and make babies because we agreed there's no more babies. So I'm like, did you fall in love? Like, what happened to you? And, and this again, someone I know really well. And she said, you know what? I started running three months ago. I've lost 15 pounds. I'm doing my first 10K in a couple of weeks. And I just feel like a million dollars. And I can't believe mm -hmm. you noticed. Again, totally appropriate, which is a nice thing to say. And she has said subsequently many times, you know how much it meant to me that you just noticed that I was yeah. happy. Yeah, it's not that hard, right? And so again, it, it's not that hard, but people have to somehow create space for themselves mm -hmm. to notice, right? Because we may also be so busy with our own work and with our own lives and kind of fail to see that, you know, the other people are people, right? And that they are so, going through things. For sure. They're not human capital. That's a terrible term. They're human yes. being, right? So yes. I'm in the Peter Drucker world, right? Management is a social science. So let's use all the social skills mm. we and if we don't have those social skills, get some coaching, get some, you know, learn to get better at this. By the way, I'm not that I'm the best ever. I'm not saying I am. I've just studied the neuroscience of social interactions for 25 years. So I've just gleaned some tips that I may have put in books like that one. Yeah. So these are human beings. Again, they'll have good days and bad days. Try to be there, try to support them, give them mm. space to grow but also those challenges right people also get bored at work i'm doing the same thing over and over yeah and so yeah for my team i often will move a junior person who's kind of ready maybe they don't know it like hey you know what we got this new project it's 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 only a one month project i think you should leave yeah. that project let's yeah. and, and we'll put a team around you and those team members might be more senior than you but they can help you but you lead that project and you know get used to it learn learn how to be a, a project leader and they're like really am i ready yeah yeah and we're we're all here for you we're all going to be there if you get stuck you just talk to us and absolutely yeah make some mistakes and that's okay that's that's cool that's how we learn yeah. I think a lot of what you're speaking to Paul is really about people want to be challenged right like maybe we focus too much on the we need to engage people we need to make people happy but really what drives real and deep happiness uh, to your point about flourishing is that you feel challenged and you create accomplishments at work, right? And so that's what you're really giving your team then the opportunity to kick ass, to kind of beat beat the challenge and and achieve something real. Yeah. So you know, do hard but doable challenges are very satisfying when you reach them. Mm. So I don't want to push you so far that you have chronic stress and you're up all night. That's not good for anybody. People are going to quit and and perform poorly. I also don't want you to be under stressed where you're like, I've been doing the same. Thing forever and I could give a crap about it. So again, it's it's a difficult leadership challenge to know when I should push employees or push those around me to go a little further than they want. It's kind of a coaching model or it's sort of, I call it cheerleader model. Like, hey, mm -hmm. you can do this. You may not mm -hmm. think you're ready, but I do. I think you're ready. And I've mm -hmm. seen a, a lot of people and give this a shot. And it's going to be a little frustrating at first. And that's okay. And I saw yeah. my graduate students. So I have you know a big lab with PhD students. And I said, by the time you finish your PhD dissertation, you're going to kind of hate me because I'm going to push you to be as good as I think you can be. I'm going to push this research yeah. hard. It's yeah. okay that you hate me because my job is to be honest and to try to get mm -hmm. as much of you as possible so that you launch your career strongly. If I just said, yeah. eh, do whatever, I don't care. I'm not a good supervisor. I'm not a good leader, right? So same thing with employees. I want to continue to push them, recognize them when they when they achieve great things or even good things, but yeah. also think about how to help them grow. And that means I need to know a lot about them. Yes. 
but also personally, right? Yes. So I had the same secretary for like 25 years. She was fabulous. And I would, you know, review her once a year and talk to her. And I'm like, are you bored? Do you want to move to somewhere else? And I'm like, you know, and she said, you know what? I got grandkids. I'm done mm. at five people. I have no stress. And she was perfect at her job. I mean, perfect. I loved yes. her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And all she needed was Monday morning for me to sit down for 10 minutes, ask me about her weekend. How was your weekend? Yeah. And she would talk about this and that. And and honestly, I really didn't care, but I cared yeah. about her and it was important yeah. to her. Yeah. So she was good for the week, right? And she was mm. she was proactive, she'd care of everything. And when she finally retired, I was just heartbroken because she was like the, the wonderful employee. So it's fine that she didn't want to progress that. She had a, a rich life outside of work, and that's totally fine. Not mm -hmm. everyone wants to have new challenges, but particularly for young people, if you look at surveys of what keeps people at their present employer, mm -hmm. it's a chance for, for professional growth. It's this reasonable work-life integration where I can still travel. I can still you know have weekends off normally. I'm on and on and on. But I think people still need to be pushed. We're we're still coaching people who are younger in particular to be successful, right? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I mean, we could definitely talk for hours more, but we're almost at the end of our time. So I kind of wanted to leave with one big last question, which is really around the future of work. And so what have you learned over those many decades of studying people that you wish you could see more of in, in the future? I'll close the narrative arc I started with, which is, I think we need to focus on emotional fitness. And so that's mm. a term I'm, I'm promoting, just like physical fitness, you can you can exercise and get stronger, you can build up your emotional fitness by having a chance to try new things, to fail, mm -hmm. to get up, try them again, to build up the strength to take the hits we have at work and at home for that matter. And so we created free software called Tuesday. You can find it at the app store that actually measures and gamifies building up emotional fitness, tells you mm. are you getting enough social emotional experience to, to, to have that strength, have that support group around you used to corporate wellness programs and health insurers. And if we are running out of humans, you guys may disagree how soon that's going to happen, but I think we are going to eventually run out of humans, or at least it's going to start shrinking the world. We've got to really think about not only physical fitness, but keeping people emotionally healthy. And we look at the really the explosion of mental health disorders now in the mm. world that are not only diminishing people's health and satisfaction with life, but yeah. causing things like suicide, just terrible things. Yeah. Having something that guides us to be emotionally healthy, I think is the thing that I'm most passionate about. So the next 10 years of my life, Don, I, that's all I want to do is further develop these technologies so that people can really live longer, happier, and healthier lives. Amazing. What a perfect note to end on. Thanks so much, Paul, for being on. What a pleasure. Thank you. Today's discussion with Paul Zak has been a fascinating journey through the intricate relationship between trust, neuroscience, workplace culture, and business outcomes. Here are a few takeaways to apply as a leader. Number one, embrace the weirdness. Recognizing and celebrating the inherent weirdness in people creates a culture where everyone feels accepted and where trust is built more easily. Number two, trust is the cornerstone of modern workplaces. Trust is even more critical for remote and hybrid teams. A zero trust environment leads to micromanagement, which in turn stifles productivity and employee satisfaction. But a high trust workplace fosters innovation, productivity and a sense of well-being amongst your people. Number three, trust and verify. Trust coupled with verification means that people have the autonomy to perform their tasks effectively while still being accountable for their outcomes. Plus, they'll enjoy it more and surely stick around longer. And number four, keep checking in. Effective communication and regular check-ins are vital in building and maintaining trust, especially in remote settings. Implementing daily huddles to discuss accomplishments, plans for the day and any support needed can keep teams aligned and focused. Weekly deeper one-on-ones provide more personalized support and coaching opportunities, ensuring employees feel valued and understood. And the last tip, be vulnerable. Leaders can leverage insights from neuroscience to enhance trust and team cohesion. 
for example by promoting a culture of vulnerability, which starts with you. It's okay to not know everything and it's okay to share that. Your team will be better for it. So that's it for today. Please join me again next week when I speak to Molly Sands, a PhD who heads up the Atlassian Team Anywhere lab, as we talk about meetings and collaborations for remote teams. Hope to see you then.